Um, and uh, this week, Chaya Sora, the Torah portion of Chaya Sora, um, the title is The Double Cave, Finding the Cave of the Patriarchs Within Us. So as always, let's start with a modern day issue. And uh, that's what we're going to um, answer through the mystical teachings. Um, yep, we go up into the mysticism and then down into the practical. And that's what makes the mysticism real and divine. So the modern day issue of this lecture, based on the mystical teachings of Kabbalah and Hasidus, is to embrace the humility and beauty of having sinned in our lives. And what these experiences offer us through Teshuva. Yes, I did say the beauty of sin. And we'll soon see. King David in Psalms chapter 66 states, and I quote you the verse, Go and see the deeds of God. Awesome are his plots upon mankind. And our sages tell us that God plots uh, for mankind to sin. And it goes on, the, the sages over there go on to prove that God has plotted upon Adam that Adam would eat from the tree of knowledge. Now the question is why? Why would God plot for us upon man to commit sins, the very sins that God himself prohibited us from performing? I profess to you that it is because second chances are the original desire of God. So there is the original desire as we understand it, that God, of God, that the man live his life performing Torah and ma'asim tovim, Torah and its good deeds. However, what takes Torah and good deeds to their true power is when they are imbued and driven by the power of teshuva. Teshuva literally means return and repentance. The truest reason for the soul's descent from its place in its utopian heaven Listen to this. The truest reason why the soul descends into this imperfect world of darkness and evil is only because in a utopian environment, as in heaven before it descended, there can be no teshuva. It is only in a life of mistakes and sins that a soul can experience the omnipotence of teshuva and the oneness with God, which comes specifically through doing teshuva. And thus the soul descends into this world, not for Torah and mitzvot and righteousness, which it had up there, but specifically for doing teshuva. And now we understand why God plots upon mankind to sin, bringing them to the opportunity of teshuva. The challenge here is when we do sin, there is a huge challenge. What is the challenge? The challenge is that we do not fall into the arrogant disbelief, self-loathing, and depression. <gasps> what? I? I have sinned? Rather, we must be humble in the acceptance of our imperfection in order to experience the power of teshuva that our imperfections, mistakes, and sin offer us. So no, don't go all into the, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. How could that be? Someone like me would do such a thing. No, rather, it's time to be humble, accept our imperfections, accept how susceptible we are to temptation. And by doing that, we can actually see the light on the other side of the tunnel, the greater light for which God put us through the tunnel of sin in order we should get to the brilliance of Teshuva. Now, this lecture is based upon a Mimer mystical teaching of the Rebbe delivered on this Shabbat in 1969, exploring the mystical and our personal and practical dimensions of the holy burial place of our patriarchs and matriarchs. And let's jump right into that holy place of patriarchs and matriarchs where they're buried. So I want to just point out to you the holiness of this place. So the holy temple in Jerusalem the central spot of Judaism would begin its day every day with the following. And I, um, I'm going to read to you from the Talmud. The appointed one said to the priest, go out and observe if it is day and the time for slaughter has arrived. If the time has arrived, the observer says there is light. One opinion. You just said it's a daytime. The sacrifices have to be brought at daytime. Here's a second opinion. Matya, the son of Shmuel, says, 
that the appointed priest phrased this question differently, saying, is the entire eastern sky illuminated as far as Hebron? And the observer would say yes. Now, according to Matthew ben Shmuel, what is the reason that he worded it specifically whether sunlight is shining over Hebron? And the answer is because in Hebron, that is where the patriarchs and the matriarchs are buried. Why do we have to mention them? Because it is necessary to evoke the powers and the merit of our patriarchs and matriarchs in order for our service to God to have its fullest impact. So too, by the way, for you and us, every day when we do our prayers, the Amidah, which is made up of 19 blessings, what is the first blessing that we say? It's called Birkat Avot. It's the blessing of the patriarchs because we need to evoke, arouse the merit and the power of the patriarchs and matriarchs for our prayer to have its fullest impact. Now, I want to just quickly show you in my notes. You can look this up by yourself. There is a picture of the way it is today. The Ma'aras HaMachpela in Hebron, the double cave, where the patriarchs and the matriarchs are buried. Now, I want to share with you, this week's Torah portion, it begins with the death of Sarah and Abraham buying this double cave to bury his wife Sarah, and where he, Isaac and Jacob, and then Rebecca and Leah, would eventually be buried. The double cave is in an area called Kiryat Arba Hi Hevron. Kiryat Arba means the city of four. Now, why do we call it the city of four? So Rav Shlomo Yitzchaki, the famous Rashi, the commentator, explains the reason why, and I'm going to read to you why it's called a double cave. A structure with an upper story over it. Another interpretation, it was called so because it was doubled with couples. So too, Rashi explains why is it called Kiryat Arba, the city of four. And one of the reasons Rashi gives, and again I quote to you, because of the four couples that were buried there, man and wife, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah. Parenthetically speaking, Jacob was told by God to bury Rachel not in the double cave, but on the road in a place in Bethlehem in order that when the Jews will be taken out to exile, they will pass through Rachel's grave. They will pray and cry there and Rachel will be aroused and her soul will go before the throne of glory and pray for her children. So it wasn't Rachel but Leah that was buried with Jacob. Now, where we're going to get to on a mystical level. We are taught Olam Katan Zeh Adam. The microscopic world, this is the human being. And everything that exists in the macroscopic world exists within the microscopic world. Thus, in the macroscopic world, there is the double cave, the Ma'arat HaMachpela, where the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried. So too it must exist within us. Thus, we are to search what and where is the double cave within us. Okay, another, another introduction. Right after the burial of Sarah, the verse begins with, and I want to read to you the verse, Vavram zakem baba yamim, and Abraham was old, advanced in days. Old, advanced in days. What's the difference between the two? Obviously there is a difference, and obviously the verse is telling us that Abraham had both. He was old, and he was advanced in days. So I'm going to share with you what it means from the Musa perspective and then from the Kabbalistic perspective. From the Musa perspective, when you say Avram was old, it means that he accomplished his general life mission. But that doesn't mean that he accomplished it day by day. It could be maybe that he didn't accomplish it for a piece of time, and then later he did Teshuvah and he accomplished it. Thus the teaching is, Baba Yamim advanced with days, which means not only did he overall fulfill his mission in life, but that every single day was a fulfilled day. Every day of Abraham's life was to be fulfilled. Thus, we're not only here to fulfill an overall purpose and mission, but also time itself. Every time, moment of our life, every day of our life is to be fulfilled. Now, I want to share with you what this means according to Kabbalah, and I quote to you the Zohar, volume 1, page 129a. It tells us as follows. 
These refer to the supernal days. Woe to he who is missing from the supernal days, that when he needs to clothe himself within these days, the day that he is missing of that garment, and Zohar goes on to say what happens when he's missing from that garment. Now what I would like to do is demystify that Kabbalistic reading I just shared with you. What are supernal days? When will we need them? Why will we need to clothe ourselves in them? So let's dissect it right now. Supernal days are referred to as the seven days that God used to create the world. Dear to the Zohar says that they were supernal days. What are the supernal days? They are the seven emotion emanations. Now what that means is, Sunday is the emanation of kindness, revelation, and thus with it God created light. Monday is the emanation of strength, and thus with it, Strength also means strictness and boundaries. And thus with it, God created the boundaries to the water. God separated the water, separating the boundaries between heaven and earth, between water and land. And that goes on every single day. I'll just jump to the seventh day. Is the emanation of kingship, which is regality. And with this, God created the holy regal Shabbat. So these are the seven emotion emanations they are what the zohar refers to as the seven supernal days and thus the zohar is saying that abram had supernal days and why does every soul need to have supernal days what this means is that there is the mitzvot the mitzvot is, is the will of God as it clothes itself within the emotion emanations every mitzvah has a different detail of emotion emanation. Charity is chesed. And then there's other ones which come from strictness and other mitzvot which come from compassion. All the 613 mitzvot make up for the soul, the garments of the seven emotion emanations. Now when will we need these? It says that when the soul will need it to close itself with it, within it. So to understand this, we need to understand that the Zohar is talking about the afterlife in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, the soul basks itself in the bliss of the revelation of divinity. There is a divine ray of light which the soul perceives, understands, absorbs, and that's where it gets its bliss and pleasure of the Garden of Eden. And because that divine ray of light is too powerful for the sun to absorb directly, that would be like looking with our human naked eye directly into the sun. Therefore, it needs to have protective garments. What are the protective garments? This is the garments of the mitzvot, the will of God, which clothes itself within the supernal days, the seven emotion emanations. This is what protects the soul so that it can safely absorb the perception understanding of the divinity of the real life of the emanation of understanding which is what exists in the garden of eden now little kabbalistic but i want to get to what we need to get to here from what i just shared with you it seems to be that the garden of eden is far greater than the performance of mitzvahs on this world. Because mitzvah observance in this world is only to serve as a garment, a protective garment, for the soul to be able to absorb the divine ray of light in the Garden of Eden. However, I want to quote you a teachings of ethics of our fathers, which says the exact opposite. In chapter 4, Mishnah 17, and I read to you, it says over there, a single moment of repentance and good deeds in this world is greater than all of the world to come. Whoa, so which is greater? Is the good deeds in this world serves only as a protective garment so that we can absorb in the afterlight in the Garden of Eden divinity? Or is it that a moment in this world doing teshuvah o ma'asim tovim, repentance and good deeds, outweighs all the bliss of the divinity perception and understanding that the soul has in the Garden of Eden. Which is it? And the answer is that the, the divine ray of light, the understanding, the emanation of understanding is a finite linear light. 
Mitzvot is the will of God. The will of God comes from the circular, infinite, encompassing, supernal crown. Now I want you to see the pro and con of each. On the one hand, the infinite circular light of the supernal crown is far greater than the, infi than, than the finite linear light of the Garden of Eden. Thus observing mitzvot, which connects us to the infinite circular will of God, is far greater than all of the pleasure of the finite ray of light of God in the Garden of Eden. However, the flip side of that is that the encompassing will of God through which we connect to, through doing mitzvot, we cannot digest. It's circular, infinite, encompassing. And that serves as a protective garment for the finite, the, 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 the finite divine ray of light in the Garden of Eden, which not only encompasses us, but we actually digest it. Thus, from the perspective of our relationship, the Garden of Eden is greater. We digest, perceive, internalize. But the mitzvot, even though it's a greater light, but it only encompasses and clothes. So that's the answer to why you have both teachings. What I want to lead to for this lecture is that if when I quoted to you the ethics of father of our fathers, you'll notice it doesn't just say ma'asim tovim, good deeds. It separates one good deed from all the good deeds. It says teshuva u ma'asim tovim. Teshuva means repentance. Why, does, uh, why do our sages emphasize that there is teshuva, repentance, and there's good deeds? What makes repentance to stand out as the first and most important point? Now, here is the answer. When our soul is in heaven, our soul is a tzaddik. It's a righteous one. However, the primary and truest purpose why our soul descends into this physical world of coldness, darkness, impurity, temptation, is only so that it can experience the omnipotence of teshuva. Here is something which is so unbelievable. The Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad Lubavitch, says that there are many reasons why the soul descends into this physical body, into the contraction and into the darkness and into the coldness and separation, physicality. Why would a soul do that? The soul was in heaven. It was in the utopian bliss. And he writes, the truest reason why the soul descends into this world is not to be righteous in studying Torah and doing mitzvot as much as in to sin in order to be able to do teshuva. Teshuva is the primary purpose of why the soul descends into this world. Now, in this lecture, through discussing the dimensions of teshuva, repentance and returning, we will find the ma'arat ha the double cave of the patriarchs and the matriarchs within us, within our microscopic world. And ultimately, that's why we read the Torah portion today in this year, in this place where we are, so that we can talk about it in the microscopic world. Where is Abraham? Where is Sarah? Where is their burial place in my beingness? And now, let's start the lecture. So as you know, I always start the lecture with giving a list of what are the mystical concepts we're going to talk about. So here are the four mystical concepts we're going to discuss today and then get back to how to deal with the acceptance of our imperfections and the gift that it affords us. Number one, the land of Canaan and the city of four. Number two, the double cave interpretation one. Number three, lower teshuva and higher teshuva. And then finally, number four, the double cave interpretation number two. Okay, let's jump right into it. Let the amazement of Hasidus begin. And I truly mean that when I say amazement. You know, there are people that, that teach Kabbalah as an abstract, hocus-pocus. 
the amazement of Hasidus is it takes the highest of the highest and brings it to the depths of the depths of our being in teaching me how to be a better person, how to do business like a fine person, how to be a divine person when I eat, when I sleep, when I dress, when I have relationships with other human beings. That's the amazement of Hasidus. So let's talk about this. The story of Sirius' burial in the double cave begins with the verse first telling us that Sarah lived for 127 years. And right after that first verse, I want to read what the second verse is. And Sarah died in Kiryat Arba. Kiryat Arba means city of four, which is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Now, what this mystically means is that Sarah lived her life of the land of Canaan before she experienced returning the city of four. I want to quote to you from a very interesting book, which is called Medrash Hanelam. Medrash Hanelam literally means the hidden Medrash, homiletic teachings. And it says like this, the city of four refers to the body because the body is composed of the four elements. So thus, verse is saying that Sarah died in Kiryat Abba. She returned her, her, her body into the earth. And then it goes on to say, in the land of Canaan, meaning that she lived her life in the land of Canaan and then she reached to Kiryat Arba. Now, what does that mean on a mystical level? What it means is that one must live their entire life in the land of Canaan before they can experience the goal in life, which we said before, that the truest reason why we are physically alive is in order to do teshuva. And thus we are taught by our sages that even Moses, did not experience teshuva until his day of passing, the last day of his life. Now, what does it mean to live your life in the land of Canaan? So if we look into our sages, they tell us that the word Canaan literally translates as mischar, doing business. This physical world is the land of spiritual opportunity and business. We can only do business negotiations, spiritual business negotiations of Torah study and mitzvah observance only while we are here down in this world. In heaven, the soul does not have a freedom of choice because it only has one choice. It only wants to be holy. Freedom of choice means I have two choices I can freely choose. The soul doesn't ever see any other choice but to be divine and selfless. And theocentric. However, when it comes down into this world, it has freedom of choice because all of a sudden the human being is made up of two sides. There's the animalistic soul and the godly soul. One says egocentric, self-centered. One says theocentric, selfless. And thus, in heaven, the soul does not have freedom of choice. Only down here. So too in heaven, the soul does not have the opportunity of the ultimate experience of Torah study and of mitzvah observance. Now, to be clear, there is the spiritual dimension of prayer, Torah study, and mitzvah observance. However, when it came time for God to give the universe the Torah, He came down to the physical Mount Sinai and gave it specifically to souls that were clothed within bodies. The purpose of the truest mitzvah and Torah is only where there exists the freedom of choice between good and evil. And thus in heaven, we're taught that we only get, our soul only gets to study the divine bliss of the Torah that we studied while we were down here. Someone that ignored a certain part and teachings of Torah down here will not get to learn it up there because here is the true place of Canaan. Here is the true place of acquiring the Torah and the mitzvot. So too, only the mitzvot that we do down here in this physical world serves as a protective garment for our soul in the Garden of Eden. And so too with the power of prayer, Yehirat Son, to stand before the master of the will, not the will, but the master of the will, changing God's will, exists here in the physical life. Thus, 
the person lives an entire lifetime in the physical land of Canaan, the land of spiritual business opportunities, and only at the very end of one's life does he get to truly experience the ultimate power of teshuva? And now we're going to jump into what that means by going to the next topic, the double cave interpretation number one. So let's talk about what the double cave means. We're going to explore it through a teaching of the Zohar. And the Zohar says concerning the double cave, man, I'll say it in English, he who doubles the letter hey, the fifth Hebrew letter, of the holy name, which is doubled. Let's talk about this. Let's right away demystify it. So God's name is spelled Yud, Hey Vav, Hey. There are two Hey's in the name of God. Now, that is what we are saying, that the double cave talks about reaching that where we have the double letter Hey in God's name. Thus, Rashi tells us in interpretation number one, that why is it called a double K, a K? Because it had a bayit, the aliyah. It had the lower story, the house, and the upper story. So too, there is the lower hay, the second hay, and then there is the upper hay, the first hay. Yud, hay, upper hay, vav, hay, lower hay. Now, to understand this, we're going to talk about teshuva. Remember we said the only reason, the primary reason, the truest reason why the soul comes down into this world is in order to experience teshuva. Now the word teshuva in Hebrew spells two words, toshuv hey, return the hey. Return the hey back to God's name. That is the mystical dimension of repentance and returning. Now, we just said that there's two Hays in God's name. Thus, according to the Holy Zohar, there is two levels of Teshuvah. There's the lower level of Teshuvah in which we return the second Hay to God's name. And then there is the higher Teshuvah in which we return the first Hay, the higher Hay to God's name. So we now have the double cave represents teshuva, two levels of teshuva, returning the lower hay and returning the higher hay, lower teshuva and higher teshuva. So let's go ahead and talk about that. What is the lower teshuva and what is the higher teshuva? So I want to talk about it in brief. Let's talk about it in brief. The lower teshuva is talking about the second hay of God's name, the final letter. According to Jewish mysticism, the final hay of God's name is called kingship. It's also called Knesset Israel, the assembly of Israel. Why is that letter of God's name called the assembly of Israel? Because that last letter hay is what becomes the godly soul within each and every Jew. Now, when the soul descends into our body and becomes the life force of our body, when the person sins, what is he doing? He is forcing and dragging with or against the will of the person, of the soul, into everything that the body is doing. So when the person sins, the hey, that letter hey, the Knesset Israel, the soul, the life force of the person is being dragged into sin. Thus, the Zohar gives the metaphor that when a person sins, he is holding on to God's head, the hay, the soul, and he's pulling it into the place of garbage, impurity, sin. Thus, teshuva means that the person will now bring back that soul within him, take it out of the impurity of sin, and return it to the purity and holiness of God's name. This is what lower teshuva is. Now, this teshuva is done through bitterness and remorse and prayer. It is done by a concentration, realization, meditation upon the darkness, the coldness, and the distance of God we have when we disconnect from God's holy Torah and we do sins. And thus, this this level of teshuva is all about reaching a bitterness and a remorse that is so deep that it removes any residue of pleasure that we had during doing the sin. 
And thus, by cleaning the soul from that impurity of pleasure of the sin, we are returning that hay back to the name of God. This is the lower teshuva done through deep remorse and bitter tears. Now let's talk about what the higher teshuva is. The higher teshuva is returning the first letter hay. Now, the, for, this is a total different type of teshuva. What that means is the letter He here represents the emanation of understanding. Yud, He, Vav, He. Yud is wisdom, He is understanding. What does it mean to us? What it means to us is the study and understanding and diligence of learning the Holy Torah. Now, what happens here is this teshuva is not the teshuva focused on the darkness, coldness, and, and distance of sin, but rather it's focusing on the warmth, the light, the compassion, and the sweetness of studying the Torah of God and being close to God. Thus, the lower teshuva is more about backing out of hell, while the higher teshuva is yearning and running towards heaven. Thus, the teshuva here, the higher teshuva, is not by me meditating upon my sins and what it does to my soul, but rather it's upon the meditation upon the goodness, sweetness, and greatness of God and how I want to be with God. And thus, I'm doing teshuva, but this is the higher teshuva. This is returning the higher hay to its holiness in the name of God. This is what it means by the double cave. We talk about the Ma'arat HaMachpelah, the double cave where the matriarchs and patriarchs reached at the end of their life, where they were buried. What this means within us is the double level of teshuva of the two haze within God's name. The lower teshuva focused on the darkness, distance, and coldness of sin, and the higher hay focusing on the warmth, the light, and the beauty of Hashem. Each one has us leave the impurity and go to the purity. Tishuva, Tashuv hay, return the hay back to God's name. Now, let's talk about the double K interpretation number two of Rashi. Now, there's a deeper interpretation of what the double cave of Tishuva is. But for that, let us see what Rashi's second interpretation of why it's called the double cave. And I read to you. Another interpretation, it was called so because it was doubled with couples. What does it mean doubled with couples? It means that it wasn't only the patriarchs, it was also the matriarchs. It wasn't only Adam, it was also Eve. Let's talk about it on the mystical level. What does it mean on the mystical level? That not only was it doubled, it was doubled with couples. What that means is that the higher teshuva and the lower teshuva are each made up of a couple. Each one divides into two. And what that means is that there is in every service of God, both in the lower teshuva and the higher teshuva, there is always two directions. One is from above to below and one is from below to above. Now, I want to attempt, even though the Rebbe, blessed memory, doesn't do this in this mimer, I'd like to attempt to explain what that means on a practical level so that you and I can connect with this. So first, let's talk about the mystical teaching. The mystical teaching, which is found in the mimer, says as follows, that there is the two dimensions of the higher teshuva, and there's the two dimensions of the lower teshuva. In the lower teshuva, I can bring the vav to the hay, or I can bring the hay up to the vav, from above to below, or from below to above. In the higher dimension of teshuva, I can bring the yud down to the hay, or I can bring the hay up to the yud. Once again, from above to below, or from below to above. Now let's talk about this to the best of my capacity, let me share with you what this means in brief on a practical level. The letter Vav, let's demystify this. The letter Vav in God's name represents emotions, while the second He in God's name represents 
the garments, that's what it's called in Kabbalah, garments, what it means is the thought, speech, and action. Now, sometimes Teshuvah works from above to below. What that means is that I work on my emotions, to sensitize my emotions, to pull it out of the self-centered self paradigm of me, 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 me. I am the center of the universe and everything exists for my pleasure. To go ahead and to sensitize my emotions, to start thinking about the truer greatness and sweetness of beingness is not the momentary, the momentary physical pleasure, but the eternal spiritual pleasure of being one with God. And once I sensitize my emotions from egocentric to theocentric, then from above to below, those emotions now drive my thought, speech, and action to be proper. So that would be in the lower teshuva from above to below. I work with the above of the lower teshuva, which is my emotions, try to crack that shell of self-centered, egocentric narcissism, and then to go ahead and to have it be imbued with the selfless, theocentric, feelings of emotions, caring about others, not just about self. And that I draw down from above to below into my thought, speech, and action. The other way is from below to above. We're talking about where I have so become so submerged into selfishness and self-centeredness and narcissism and egocentric that I am incapable of the sensitivity of caring about another to break out of the meanness, me, me, me. Thus, what can I do when I'm so submerged that I don't even have the control to break out of my self-centeredness? Here we have to work from below to above. Here I need to just obediently emphasize the word, obediently act against my emotional drive and do thoughts, speech, and action of selflessness. To do a random deed of kindness for others even when I don't feel like it. To stop thinking only about myself even when I feel driven to think only about me and my suffering and my pain and what I need in life. And by obediently forcing myself to control my thoughts, speech, and action, they should not be 24-7 about the me, 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 me syndrome. Eventually, I bring the hey, my thoughts, speech, and actions up to an emotions that has sensitivity for others. So in the lower teshuva, the above to below, work with the emotions, which will then draw the thought, speech, and action. Or if we're not capable of that, then from below to above, obediently do the right thing until you feel the right thing. Let's now go to the two levels in the higher teshuva. What does it mean in the higher teshuva from the above to below and below to above? What this means is we said to bring the yud down to the hay or the hay up to the yud. Now, Yud represents wisdom. He, the first He of God's name, represents understanding. What is the difference between the dot of the Yud and the three-lined He? The dot of the Yud, wisdom, represents the core essence point of the entire intelligence teaching here. Whatever it we're talking about. We're talking about Torah. In Torah, what that means is the wisdom of the Torah is the divinity of the Torah. The He, the understanding, the three-dimensional understanding represents all the details in the width, length, and depth of the concept. Thus, the understanding of Torah is studying the methodology of Torah. The wisdom of Torah is to find God within his Torah understanding that this is a holy study and not just an academic study. To understand that when I digest Torah, I am becoming attached and one with God. So there's the Yud, the divinity of the Torah, the He, the details, understanding of all the data of the Torah. Now let's discuss from the above to below and below to above. One way of studying Torah is 
to focus and meditate on the divinity in the Torah, to understand the oneness of Torah with Hashem, and how when I study Torah, I am opening up my mind to be dominated by God and God's paradigm. It's not about just understanding this detail and coming up with a question and coming up with an answer and putting everything in its proper box. First and foremost, I have a sensitivity to the holy Torah, Torah HaGdosha. And that's why before we study Torah, we make a blessing. A blessing is of a holiness. And that's when we start feeling the divinity of the Torah. And thus, I want to study more Torah and more Torah and another detail of Torah and another piece of Torah. Because the divinity of the Torah bring down into the details of Torah. And thus, I want to stop living my mundane life and become a more Jewish person in the sense of living a Jewish life. On the other hand, that's from the above to below. Connect with the divinity and the kedusha of the Torah and bring it down to the details of the Torah. But sometimes, because of my overindulgence in physical pleasure, I am not sensitive to any divinity in the Torah. I am impressed by the brilliance of the Torah. But can I say that I feel the divinity of the Torah, the kedusha of the Torah? And thus, we have to work from below to above. With obedience, we need to study another Mishnah, another Pasuk, another Parasha, another chapter Tanya, another Ma'amar Chasidut. We have to force ourselves to study another piece, another piece, another piece. And then, just like with the puzzle, when I don't at first know the inner core message of the puzzle, I'm only fitting in one piece, another piece, another piece, another piece. And by all the pieces, eventually, I begin to see the core message of the Torah, that it's all about Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, God is our God, God is one. This is from below to above, from understanding to wisdom, from details to the one inner core message of the Torah. And thus we now have the two interpretations of the double, double cave. Double cave as in higher teshuva, lower teshuva, and then doubled with couples that within each teshuva, there's from the above to below and below to above. Emotions to thought, speech, actions, thought, speech, actions, to emotions, and so too from the divinity of Torah to the details of Torah, or from the details of Torah to the divinity of Torah. This is what the double cave, the Ma'arat HaMachpelah, which is in Kiryat Arba, which is in Hebron, where Adam and Eve, Avram and Sarah, Yitzchak and Rivka, Rachel and, Le I'm sorry, Yaakov and Leah are buried, that's the way it exists within us. It's all about reaching the two Hays of God's name and to understand it's all about Tishuva, Tashuv Hay, bring back the Hay. Lower, higher, from above to below and below to above. Now, in closing. In closing, I want to share with you two teachings that the Rebbe makes an emphasis upon in this Ma'amar. I didn't mention them. Two short points. Number one, the Rebbe points out that the double cave is in the city of four. Remember we said the city of four is when we return our body, which is composed of four elements. What does this mean? The Rebbe tells us what this teaches us is that one can do teshuva even upon his deathbed. All of these great things that we were talking about, the higher teshuva, the lower teshuva, in the lower teshuva, teshuva from below to above or above to below, in the higher teshuva, from below, to, from below to above or above to below, all those great levels, one after another, all of them, it's never too late. We always have the opportunity until our dying breath, our last breath, to do teshuva. It's never too late. How much more so if we still have years to live, but we think, oh my God, I'm already in my 50s. Oh my God, I'm already in my 40s, my 60s. Never too late. It's always available to us until Kiryat Arba, until that moment we return our body to earth. And then the second emphasis that the Rebbe makes is it's called city of four. All four are connected. The four levels of teshuvah that we spoke about, 
the two levels of the higher teshuvah, the two levels of the lower teshuvah, all are connected. And therefore, the soul of the lowest level of teshuvah is the highest level of teshuvah. So even when the teshuvah, the lowest level of teshuvah, is only about the fear of retribution, it's interesting. I know a person who lived in California. He wasn't religious, but he wouldn't eat on Yom Kippur because he's afraid if he ate on Yom Kippur, he would choke on what he ate. Mm, that's called Yom Kippur? Yes, it is. The fear of retribution is a dynamic of teshuva, and once it's in the realm of teshuva, the lowest level and the highest level are connected because the highest level is the soul of the lowest level, even if we don't consciously feel it. All I feel is the fear of retribution, the lowest level, and that's why I'm doing teshuva. But we need to know that in the lowest level, the soul of the lowest level which our subconscious feels is the highest level of teshuva. And the highest level of teshuva comes from a verse in the Ecclesiastics, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. That's what it's all about, teshuva, hey, returning the highest levels. So therefore, the modern day message is to be humble and accept without resentment, without self-loathing, and without depression towards ourselves, that A, Yes, we are imperfect and have sinned. Get over it. We're not so mighty and high. We are imperfect and we sin. B, whenever we do teshuva, regardless of how late in the game it may be, it is the precise God time for us to do this teshuva. So if we wake up in the 50s, uh, fifth decade of our life and we say, oh my God, it's time to become a mensch, that's the time. And then C, that even if we are incapable in the moment to do any altruistic level of teshuva, and all that we presently feel is the teshuva driven by a fear of retribution, I'm afraid to eat on Yom Kippur because I might choke, choke. This is enough. And within this lies the highest levels of teshuva. Thank you, my friends.